All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, in this quick video, I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about matrix multiplication, uh, something that you're probably familiar with just doing the operations you know, by hand in a math class. Uh, but of course, matrix multiplication is something that we might also want to carry out computationally. Um, there are many uh, operations in cryptography, computer graphics, where we rely on matrices of numbers uh, to do the calculation. And occasionally, those matrices get really large and maybe have really large numbers in them. And we want to efficiently be able to compute those multiplications. And there are a couple different algorithms related to that. But I want to look at just our standard algorithm for matrix multiplication. So let's, again, start by maybe formalizing the problem. Remember, step one of our divide and conquer strategy is to always formalize the problem. So <clears throat> I'm going to limit my matrix multiplication here to just n by n matrices. That's just going to simplify some of our questions, uh, you know, the algorithm, and noting that, of course, we could generalize this to other size matrices if we wanted to, uh, but we want to focus on the simplest problem first. So if we have two n by n matrices A and B, we want to compute the product of them, uh, in this case A times B, uh, keeping in mind they're not commutative, so B times A could be different. Uh, so we want A times B here, um, and if we have two n by n matrices, uh, then we're going to get uh, an n by n matrix as a result as well. And it's been a while since you reviewed your matrix multiplication. Uh, we do have a good uh, way of uh, you know, multiplying them together, uh, let's maybe take a look at example matrix here. So let's say we have uh, a matrix here with our first row, maybe our first column here. Again, matrix B, first row, first column. They're n by n, so there's n rows and columns. And of course, if we want to compute our resulting matrix C here, say we want to compute um, uh, just the entry C11, we're going to take the first row we're going to multiply it by the first column, pairwise, A11 gets by B11, and so on. Uh, add them all together, and that's going to get us just this entry here. So actually, we can express that using our summation notation. If we want to look at entry IJ, we're going to take row I and column J, and we're going to multiply pairwise those elements together as we go, and then add them all up. And that'll give us the entry for Cij. Now, this expression makes it pretty easy for us to see that how many multiplications do we need to do to calculate Cij? We need n of them. We're going to do n of these. And then also n additions, or n minus 1, depending on how you, how you carry that out. But order n additions as well. So just to calculate this one entry, we need to do theta of n operations. And there are n squared such entries in here. So our total algorithm here is going to be uh, n cubed. OK. Maybe not too surprising. Again, the whole size of the matrix is n squared. So um, we have to spend at least n squared operations to do that. If we did a constant amount of work on each one, well, we can't do a constant amount of work on each one. We're doing a linear amount of work. So we end up with n cubed. And the question might be, is there a way is there a way for us to improve this? Okay. Well, again, we're going to try and apply our divide and conquer strategy. We've already formally, uh, already formally stated the problem, so now we want to start thinking about this self-reduction and identifying subproblems. And we are going to be inspired again by uh, maybe Karatsuba's algorithm uh, and some of the other algorithms that we've already looked at. Uh, so. Uh, one way we can think about that is maybe if we think about our matrix. Again, let's think of a large matrix. Okay, uh, So our n is quite large. Well, say we want to split it in two. Well, when you split a two-dimensional thing in two, you actually get four chunks out of it. So if this was our a, we're going to get four sub-arrays. And we might call them a11, a12, a21, A22. And then we could do the same thing for our B. Again, maybe split it into four chunks. B11, B12, B21, and B22. 
And again, we could say, well, then what is a times b if we were to do that? Okay, well, again, this is maybe not too hard to see. Um, let's just maybe do it for one. I, I don't think I've left enough space here. But my first entry here, the first submatrix here, the whole submatrix, is just going to be a11 times b11. Now that's a matrix by matrix multiplication plus a12 times b21, this matrix down here. This first row of matrices multiply by the first column of matrices here. This actually works out. We could do it another entry here, here, and here. Okay, and we could see that what would we end up with? Well, I've got one, two multiplications here. I'll have two in each of these, so I'm going to end up with eight multiplications, each one of size n over two. How much extra work did we do? Well, we had to do all these additions. How many additions is that? Well, that's going to be about n squared additions. Let's jump into our master theorem to think about this. We've got a here, b here. So our log base b of a is log base 2 of 8 is 3. So we're comparing n cubed to n squared. Which one is faster? Grows faster? n cubed. So it looks like even recursively here, oops, we've got an n cubed algorithm. Well, that, that mirrors what we did with Karatsuba's algorithm in the last video, right? The straightforward application of recursion just gets us the same runtime back. We don't, we haven't made any improvements. So what that means is we probably need to be a little bit more clever than that. Um, and to do that, uh, we're going to want to mirror what, well, uh, Strassen did when he came up with his algorithm. Now, with Karatsuba's algorithm, uh, it was actually pretty easy for us to sort of follow and understand how he reduced the, the four multiplications down to three. Okay. Now with Strauss's algorithm, we're going to reduce our eight algorithms down to seven, but the, the way that the cleverness that he uses is no longer very clear. It's very opaque and it, you would have to take some time to work with it to sort of understand it. So we're not, we're not going to work with it in a lot of detail or, or, or at all actually. And I'm not going to do an example with it. Instead, I just want to show uh, basically the effort that he did. Now, he did this in 1969, uh, which was uh, almost 10 years after um, Karatsuba's algorithm. I'm not 100% sure how he, if he knew of Karatsuba's algorithm or if he was inspired by it, but it uses a similar technique. Um, but the amount of sort of mental effort uh, required to do the cleverness, you know, remember part three is the cleverness here, um, is considerable. And again, this algorithm is now named after him for the effort that he did. Okay, so this was the work that we just carried out together, uh, splitting our array in two, noting that we could recursively compute these eight, uh, eight multiplications, but resulting with the master theorem in a runtime of n cubed. So Strassen comes at the problem with the same starting position here, the idea that we've got these four uh, matrices we need to compute. We normally compute them with eight multiplications, but if we could somehow reduce the number of multiplications, somehow get one of these a little cheaper for only one multiplication instead of two, we could get away with it. Now remember, in, in Karatsubas that meant doing something weird where we took the upper bits and the lower bits and added them together. Although we were able to follow the reasoning why we might want to do that. Now here, he's going to do the same thing. He's going to take submatrices and add them together or maybe subtract them. Now, following the reason why he chose those submatrices, you probably have to dive a lot more into the nature of matrix multiplication to understand it. So here's exactly what he's done. Um, he's decided that he's going to compute seven resultant matrices. He's calling them M1 to M7. And all of these result matrix, the C matrices that we want, you can express as some sum or difference of those other seven matrices. Now notice he doesn't compute C11 or C12 directly like we did for our P and our Q in Karatsubas. All of them are aggregate matrices, meaning we have to build them out of the other ones. Now what were the five, the seven matrices that he came up with? Well, these are the seven matrices and all of them are a little bizarre, right? Adding two submatrices together and then multiplying them by two other submatrices that are added together. 
top quadrant, bottom right quadrant. Bottom right, top left, add them together, multiply them. That's our M1. Again, to check the math behind all of these matrices, matrices calculations would be a lot of work. Strassen did it himself and proved it himself, so we don't have to. And now if you really need Strassen's algorithm, you, you just want to refer to something like this to implement it. Of course, if you really do need Strassen's algorithm today, there's probably a library with it already implemented. Uh, or go ask Wolfram Alpha. It will probably multiply your matrices for you quickly as well. Okay, so what's the takeaway of this? Well, the takeaway is that Strassen's algorithm is able to reduce one of our multiplications. So we no longer have an algorithm uh, with eight multiplications. Here we got seven. So doing our master theorem calculation, we now get log base two of seven. Now that's still bigger than two. So that's still going to be the dominant term, but it's an improvement on our runtime of n cubed. So this is less than three. Okay, so again, Strassen's algorithm is just another, the reason I wanted to go through it is not because I want to dive into the, the tangled mess that are the, the, the various submatrices that he calculates, but instead I want to show that that same strategy that Karatsuba applied to come up with his faster algorithm, and that can be applied to come up with even faster algorithms, uh, was applied here by Strassen uh, to once again come up with a faster algorithm. Now this is again an example of a divide and conquer uh, algorithm, and actually that exhausts the divide and conquer algorithms that I wanted to look at in this series of, uh, of videos on divide and conquer. Now, uh, that's not to say that there aren't other divide and conquer algorithms out there. There are actually a considerable number of other uh, simple ones and a couple other interesting ones you might apply in everyday computing. Probably uh, the one that I feel that I've overlooked the most in this series is uh, the closest pair of points in a, in a plane. Um, and there is a good n log n uh, version of that algorithm that's also divide and conquer. And maybe I'll just leave that as uh, sort of an exercise or something, a challenge exercise to think about, or some extra research to do. Go, go find some extra uh, material on that, the closest pair of points uh, in a plane. Well, uh, since this ends our series of videos on divide and conquer, uh, that means the next series of videos coming up are going to be on a new uh, uh, design technique, uh, and that technique is called dynamic programming. So uh, stay tuned for the next video in which we're going to look at uh, a simple example of dynamic programming, uh, which is calculating uh, numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.